Welcome back to Left, Right and Center. As I said, the big news development today has been the arrest of Chota Rajan in Bali. In Indonesia, this was based on a tip-off by Australian police. The Ministry of Home Affairs has uh, responded welcoming this arrest. They're hoping to bring him back to India and interrogate him here as well. The CBI chief has also just spoken about this arrest. CBI had been in touch with the Australian authorities regarding the fugitive Chota Rajan. And uh, yesterday at our request, Bali police has arrested one Mohan Kumar. We are ascertaining and verifying the details. Further action will be taken as required under the law. However, we take this opportunity to thank Australian and Indonesian counterparts and this uh, very good and close cooperation that they have extended to us. We thank them for this. Um, these are the things which can be answered later. Right now is not Sir, the opportune time to... Sir, what is the future for the actions? I mean, what happens... All these things will get you in a reasonable time. Now, we are not just telling you that they are arresting them by Bali police. And we are talking with the Australian authorities. Our प्रयास था कि फ्यूजिटिव छोटा राजन को अपहरण किया जाए सीबीआई काफी समय से प्रयास की और उनको वहां अरेस्ट किया गया है आगे की कार्रवाई जैसा भी लॉ में रिक्वायर्ड है उसके मुताबिक होगा हालांकि हम इस अवसर पे ऑस्ट्रेलियन और इंडोनेशियन काउंटर पार्ट्स को उनके अच्छे सहयोग के लिए जरूर उनका धन्यवाद करना चाहते हैं क्या आपकी टीम भी निकल चुकी है या ऑलरेडी वहां पर है देखिए कुछ सवालों के जवाब देना जरूरी नहीं होता है और मैं भी आपको ये बता रहा हूं कि दिस इज नॉट द राइट टाइम टू गिव दिस काइंड ऑफ डिटेल्स Right, that was on the arrest of Chota Rajan. Let's move on to our other big focus tonight on left, right and center. It's the India-Africa Summit, a mega diplomatic event taking place in Delhi. 54 African heads of state in the capital. What does that mean for diplomacy? What does that mean for security? That's another debate altogether. But uh, Sigda Basu reports from day one of that event. Day one of the India-Africa summit, a pageant with over 200 delegates on their way to day-long discussions. The senior officials' meeting kicked off with a moment for the cameras. But the rest was behind closed doors, where issues from terrorism, clean energy, UNSC reform to food security were discussed. Seen as a major diplomatic push for India, the event is also about a little competition with China, which is hosting a similar summit in December. China come in Africa just to, to, to develop a human resource for himself first. But India, I think, tried to translate techni technic or um, skills. skills for us. It's not the same way. Nevertheless, India is lagging way behind China when it comes to business with Africa. China's trade with Africa is worth $200 billion till 2014, and India's trade with Africa is just $70 billion till 2014. The one thing about the Chinese is because they're so good at what they're doing in terms of infrastructure and at making every little thing, when they decide to come to a country, they literally come with everything. I'd say the Chinese presence is more visible than the Indian presence. If I think Indians in Namibia, I think mostly culture, food, cuisine, or perhaps retail. Our engagement with Africa is in terms of human resources, people-to-people -people contact, um, exchange of ideas, capacity building, etc., where we can gain and Africa can gain. Although the previous summits have been smaller in scale, but not in aspiration. But through this large-scale summit, the Modi government wants to showcase that the India-Africa relationship goes beyond just strategic considerations. With camera person Kanan Patra, Snigdha Basu, NDTV. Right, well, joining us to discuss this summit in the studio, we have uh, former diplomat Jeet Pat Sarthi with us. You've 
returned today from Addis Ababa and you've also served in African nations. Aman Sethi, senior journalist, who's also served as a reporter in, uh, in uh, Addis Ababa as well for a couple of years. Uh, Shazia Ilmi and Praveen Swami staying on with us from the previous discussion. Mr. Pakhtati, I want to open this with you since you say you've returned just this morning. Uh, this summit is really something that, uh, as, a, as a diplomatic correspondent in India, I've not seen take place uh, in, in, in a long time, perhaps ever, so many heads of state from African countries in one space well, in Delhi in a long well, you know, this together. Is a, it's an evolutionary process. It started in 2008 in the India-Africa summits. Earlier it was confined to 12 to 14 countries. Yeah. This time it's more ambitious, it's 54. Uh, but I think the larger issue one needs to bear in mind is contemporary importance. We are seeing a, a world order where major economies, whether it's China or European Union, are lagging and slowing down. The largest growing markets are going to be Africa and Latin America. For us, it's the largest growing money is on our Indian Ocean shores. We have a security <laughs> connection with them. And, and therefore, cultivating them is very important. And the, I'm, I, you know, this comparison with China is not a good thing to do. Hmm. The, Chinese have, uh, the Chinese have some USPs, which is infrastructure projects. Now, having served in Africa and having just come back from there where we've just built an Indian company, the Canary Industries have just built the first denim factory in, India, uh, in, this, in, in Africa. Uh, others have, have done likewise, like the many years ago, Walchans in Sugar. Hmm. So I think we should stop this competition business and concentrate on what wins us political goodwill compatible with our, uh, with okay. our capacities. We have focused, as one of the African speakers said, largely on training Africans. We've had at certain stages from, say, T Tanzania, 200 uh, uh, water resource engineers who have set up all the irrigation projects there. Indian assistance there is important in those terms. Yes, trade has gone up to $72 billion, hmm. the, which is more than our trade with China. Uh, investments in Africa... But you're looking at a country versus a continent. Yes, but then they uh, look at the size of China and the, the economic size. But this is a growing market and it's vast natural resources. As I said, leaving aside Ethiopia and so many other countries, yeah. most important contribution we made okay. came during the last two summits, which was satellite linkages through Senegal to provide their schools and hospitals okay. with direct links. Okay. Aman, I want to ask you as well, because one of the, uh, the guests my colleague Sigdha spoke to said that, you know, when you think of China, you think of uh, big infrastructure projects. When you think of India, you think of culture, cuisine, the diaspora, right. because right. there's Indian right. diaspora in every corner of the continent, uh, no matter which country you go to. How do you translate uh, or cash in on that soft power that clearly Indians have generated? Well, um, I think there's a fundamentally different way in which uh, the Chinese operate in, in, in Africa. So a lot of the infrastructure is by state-owned uh, companies called parastatals, mm. uh, which means that they come with the kind of money that a government can put behind a company and they take on accordingly very large projects. In India, it's largely private sector, uh, which, I mean, I think one way of thinking about this in terms of even this kind of small culture, etc., is just to kind of look at some stats. And one way of thinking about it is that India primarily uh, imports crude petroleum. That's like 35% of our imports from Africa, primarily from Nigeria. Yeah. India primarily exports uh, processed petroleum. So, so I think there's a lot of there's, and and if we look at Indian investment in in Africa, it's it's quite minuscule. So if you look at say, you know, the the Prime Minister in his conversation with African editors said 50 billion dollars of investment, but out of that, about 95% is money that's round tripped through Mauritius. Hmm. So about 45 yeah. billion out of that is perhaps Indian money that's gone to Mauritius and come back. So, you know, it, Mauritius is one of the largest investors in India. Hmm. And Mauritius is also one of the largest destinations of Indian uh, FDI going out. Right. So I think that gives us some sort of a pattern. So so I think that the picture, um, I think what, what, what summits like this do is they generate good intergovernmental goodwill. Hmm. Uh, but I think um, if you kind of look at the data and you kind of start opening it out, you realize these are 54 different countries. Uh, the engagement with each country is different. Hmm. Um, and I think that the picture is, is, is I think the, the way that a lot of these summits tend to work is they prioritize big projects and, and big money and uh, big corporations, including Indian corporations. So right. they want market access. They want these kinds of things. The India story is largely kind of freelance traders and freelance operators. Which is what it has been consistently for yeah, generations. So it's, it's pretty much still well, that. Except, my, I think, to add to what he said, what we are doing by way of human resource development there is highly appreciated. Skills development. Uh, this is point one. 
the Chinese, let me put it to you this way, are looked at as being very mercantilist and racist, hmm. which we are not. Hmm. They have had problems in the past because of that. So I would not like to get into this business because Ag Africans are very sensitive to outside exploitation. Yeah. Go where you are naturally expected and wanted and make it a mutually beneficial affair. No free lunches. But that is the challenge, I think. Uh, Praveen, I want to bring you and Shazia into this as well. But Praveen Swami, first, one of the other issues that uh, is going to be discussed at this summit, apart from the economics of it all, is also on, uh, uh, you know, security cooperation. We, we're looking at vast terror networks that have consistently been operating out of uh, African nations. Uh, in, in your view, is this summit going to yield anything tangible when it comes to security cooperation? Well, India's big concern, of course, being security in the Indian Ocean. Uh, piracy, for example, emanating from Somalia, Somalia imposed yeah. enormous costs on the Indian uh, uh, Indian trade with, with insurance premiums jacking up, with the cost of uh, uh, tra transiting cargo through the area uh, uh, jacking up. And um, the, the problem really is that uh, India's armed forces aren't uh, in a position as yet to become net providers of security for the entire region. Uh, that's a role that certainly India, uh, many expect India to fulfill in the long term, but we're very far from there. Uh, on counterterrorism cooperation, yes, there are lots of problems in North Africa, in East Africa, which potentially impinge uh, on Indian interests. Uh, but India has historically been very, very reluctant to get involved uh, in things even much closer uh, to our borders. Hmm. Uh, witness our reluctance to get involved in the multinational um, coalition now fighting against the Islamic State. <laughs> Uh, I don't think there'll be any appetite in New Delhi for strategic involvement in other international coalitions involved in, in parts of Africa. Um, we have had some levels of military cooperation. We have Indian military officers in many uh, African nations. We have robust military-to-military -military training cooperation uh, with many countries. Uh, but, but, I, but, I, but I think the reality is that uh, the expansion of Chinese power in that area has been far more dramatic uh, and that's a function of Chinese wealth and investment in their military. Uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Okay. Shazia, uh, lots of issues on the agenda, but something that you hear consistently from many African uh, representatives, uh, ambassadors from various African countries, for example, uh, in Delhi, they say is that, you know, nobody thinks of us unless there's some crisis, disaster, calamity, war, you know, something that's not very pleasant, uh, the Ebola virus that brings Africa back on the map and African countries back on the map. Do you think that a summit like this is also, in a sense, a PR exercise that's going to work towards creating an awareness about uh, a continent which most Indians uh, are not very familiar with? Yes, it's, it's so much like uh, taking the heart out from the heart of darkness, so to speak, which how Africa has been spoken of. But, you know, everybody keeps saying that this is beyond strategic um, importance and considerations, and Prime Minister has also said it. And I would agree to a great extent with that because this is so much more. If you look at a India and Asia, look at, look at the, the colonialization that has happened to both the countries. Look at the socio-economic indices. Look at also the fight against injustice and poverty that both, both these uh, entities face day after day. Look at the huge uh, linkages and... Uh, uh, kinship that has been there. But we also have to look in present situation as to where India stands and what Africa thinks also of India and how much it supports India where the WTO rounds are concerned on agricultural subsidies. We also have to see what Africa views and what our, our, our African countries views because the 40 heads of states are from 54 countries from Africa. Now this is a brilliant and a vast diplomatic outreach ever that has happened of this kind. Right. So imagine on something like TPP, you know, uh, the Trans-Pacific Treaty, what, where, what do African nations feel? And also building institutions, okay. capacity building, okay. human resource development. So we're really buying into something which is to do with uh, uh, beyond uh, strategic considerations, but also strategic considerations. Okay. Also okay. investment in each other. And when there's a slowdown everywhere in Europe particularly, India and Africa really should reach out more to each other and need each other much more than before okay. and also demographically All there right. is so much more in common in terms of youngsters and millennials 
ruling the roost and the market, so to speak, okay. in years to come. All right, Shazia. Aman Sethi, Shazia is making an interesting point, which is that, you know, India also needs to see what's in it for us, so to speak, when it comes to engagement with these countries. So, in your view, as somebody who's spent time there, a summit like this, what are we looking at? What is India looking at gaining from it? Because clearly you're not going to spend all this money and invite them if it's going to be coming to naught. Well, I, I don't think the... <laughs> I don't think it's that much money if you, if you look at it in, in, terms of, in terms of the way that money is spent. Um, I think in terms of Indian strategic interests, so every time I've spoken to diplomats, they've spoken in precisely these kind of wishy-washy kind of ideas, right? And, and I suppose that's what diplomacy is, right? It's the PR of nation states. So, they, so it's basically spin in the hope that if we remain friends, then one day when I need to call on you, I will call on you. Yeah. So, so I, don't think, I don't think anyone can deny the value of such an exercise. I mean, that's something that I guess nation states do. Hmm. Um, I think that if we, but as journalists and analysts, we're not bound by, by exactly these frameworks. So I think if we, if we look at it in a slightly clear-eyed way, uh, one way of looking at it is precisely these synergies that, that Shazia talks about are, are also competitive points. So, you know, we're both kind of infrastructure poor, labor surplus, kind of broadly speaking economies. I think both uh, many African nations, particularly along the eastern coast and mm. India, are vying for the same uh, manufacturing spill-off from China as wages in China go up. You've got you know, Ethiopia wanting to set up uh, manufacturing hubs. You've got India wanting to set up manufacturing hubs. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a sort of delicate, it's a delicate dance. So, so I don't understand how, and, I, and I'm genuinely befuddled when people say this is a win-win because we have identical strengths and identical weaknesses, this hmm. doesn't seem like a win-win, but I'm sure in, in, in a broader perspective one can, one can put it that Mr. way. Mr. Parsad, is a win-win no, no, is diplomatic waffle in a sense, isn't it? I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I, I look at it this way, that look at where we were hmm. and look at where we are. Hmm. I think the fact of the matter is that India is built an, uh, built an image there that we are not pushy, that by and large we are not, we are not the sort of country which is going to dish out money. And I, I'm convinced that within 10 to 20 years, China is going to go through a very difficult time there. I've seen it happen in the past during the Tanzan Railway when they built it. Hmm. When, they, when, they, when they build a project, let me just tell you, when they build a project, there's no transfer of technology. They built the Tanzan Railway, the Tanzanians couldn't change a light bulb. It took Indian railways to go there and do it for them. Now, we do these things very quietly. There's no song and dance about it, but that is appreciated. I don't think we have the resources to pour in money anywhere. So let us be very, very clear. So we Where don't have the resources to, to pour, pour in, in money, money, yet we say, it, you know, like be on our side, even though we don't have no, the resources the, but the to pour in this, money. No, the point is this. The point is this. Don't go to China. The point is this. No, hmm. we don't say don't go to China. Hmm. That's a mugs game. Hmm. I don't think we should ever do it. Hmm. Never tell an African what he should do or not do. You know, we, I would we are so. We, 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 we know we see are so patronizing. <laughs> My 21 African countries have higher per capita incomes than us. Eight of them have per capita incomes four times that of ours. Hmm. And there are about 30 or 35 functioning dem <laughs> democracies in a form. So I think this business of being patronizing is, is something we should learn to get over. We still have a colonial hangover on hmm. that. But the, the fact of the matter is. It has been a quiet success story. Forty heads of state don't just land up in New Delhi to, to eat oranges and bananas. They come here because they expect something. And they have seen it twice over. So I think, as I said, in this summit, I would hope to see, as Shazia said, much more cooperation on WTO. Okay. Because we are facing serious challenges from the Trans-Pacific Partnership yeah. and others. Second, I think the fact of the matter is the building of their capacities is something they greatly appreciate. Okay. Because it's done at no cost, it's done at something, we do, we do it concessional, and sometimes we've even got third country fund, funding for it. Okay. So I think let's not have these ambitions of becoming a superpower, as so some minister here said, Chappan and Chati and all that. But let's be serious. There are limits to which what we can do. And I think given this, yeah. over the years, we've done a good job, okay. even with the previous government. But this, taking it to 54 is certainly good. Okay, all right. Well, we have three more days of this summit to go through, and lots of issues will probably come up. But thank you all very much uh, for joining us on this discussion on the India-Africa Summit. It's kicked off today a massive uh, diplomatic exercise where, as we said, 54.